For those of you whom I haven't met, my name is Michael Liu. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Health at Berkeley, and I want to welcome all of you to opening night of the Dean's Speaker Series. Now, before we start, I just want to take a moment to thank our campus co-sponsors, the Goldman School of Public Policy and the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. Thank you for your support. I'm really looking forward to our partnerships in the coming years in advancing health equity and social justice here at home and around the globe. This evening, I'm continuing a tradition of bringing distinguished public health leaders to come and talk with our Ber Berkeley public health community. We're honored tonight to have with us Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, the first Surgeon General of California. <laughs> Nadine was appointed Surgeon General by Governor Newsom in January this year. She's an award-winning pediatrician, researcher, and advocate with a distinguished career that focuses on serving vulnerable families and combating the root causes of health disparities. She's a Cal alum with a bachelor's degree in integrative biology from Berkeley. <laughs> she received her MD from UC Davis, her MPH from T.H. Chan School of Public Health at Harvard, or better known as Berkeley of the East, <laughs> and completed her pediatric residency at Stanford. In 2013, she founded the Center of Youth Wellness at Bayview Hunters Point in San Francisco, designed to transform the way society responds to children exposed to childhood trauma and toxic stress. Her TED Talk, How Childhood Trauma Affects Health Across a Lifetime, has been viewed over six million times. Her book, The Deepest Wealth, Healing the Long-Term Effects of Childhood Adversity, was called Indispensable, by the New York Times. She's the recipient of many distinguished awards, including the Humanism Award from the American Academy of Pediatrics, one of the, the highest honors uh, bestowed uh, by the APA. For the past year and a half, I had had the honor of serving alongside Nadine on the Committee for the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, which just released a report in July called Vibrant and Healthy Kids Aligning Science, Practice, and Policy to Advance Health Equity. The report built on a previous Institute of Medicine report called Neurons to Neighborhood and draws upon all the scientific advances over the past two decades to develop a roadmap on what our nation must do to make sure that all of our children, no matter where they're from or the families that they're born into or the color of their skin, have a fair shot at reaching their fullest potential. Nadine and I worked on chapters summarizing the neurobiological sciences and envisioning health systems transformation. And over the past year and a half, I've come to admire the power of her extraordinary intellect, and more importantly, the authenticity of her deep-rooted passion for health equity and social justice. So as a Californian, I just have this to say, Governor Newsom, good job. <laughs> and Nadine, we're so lucky and so proud to have you championing public health and health equity for the people of California. So thank you. All right. Can you hear me? Okay. So let me get this conversation started. And this is how this is going to work. Uh, this is not just a conversation between Nadine and me. It's really a conversation between Nadine and all of our public health community. Right, so I'll get the, the, uh, the, the conversation started, but when you came in, you should have gotten a note card, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes? I guess we ran out of note cards. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, well, we'll have people come around okay, with note cards uh, and just kind of write down your question. We're gonna try to get to as many, as many of your questions as we can. Uh, so probably about 20 minutes from now, I will call for the questions. You'll have student volunteers to like come by and, and pick up the questions and then we'll try to go through them as quickly as possible. Okay, so, so let's go ahead and, and get started. Uh, 
And I hate to start a conversation with a stupid question, but the, the great thing about being a new dean is you're kind of still in that honeymoon period. <laughs> So, so you know, like you get to ask all sorts of stupid questions, and people don't like really judge you for now. Uh, so, so, so uh, Nadine, you're, you're the first Surgeon General of California. There are only three states in the nation that actually has a Surgeon General. Okay. So, what exactly does a Surgeon General do? <laughs> I will say, uh, first of all, I love stupid questions because I was also <laughs> always the one asking them in uh, medical school mm -hmm. and public health school. Um, um, but yeah, so what the heck does a state surgeon general do? Um, so here in California, we have been, uh, I, I think, uh, extraordinary, extraordinarily fortunate that we have a governor that recognizes that early social determinants of health are a root cause of some of our most serious, pervasive, and expensive health consequences that is facing the state of California. And as a result, what Governor Newsom did in literally his first day in office was he uh, wrote an executive order to create the role of Surgeon General. And the explicit directive of the Surgeon General was, uh, number one, to marshal the insights of our scientific community, our public health community, our public servants, and everyday Californians to be able to tackle these serious and inequitable challenges that are facing California today. Um, the second big part of the role of uh, State Surgeon General is really to be a medical advisor to the governor, right? Mm -hmm. to, to, um, uh, to bring together the best science and to share that in, in being an advisor to the governor around health-related issues. And, uh, and the last part, which... Uh, I want to say it's my favorite part, but I think, may, I mean, I love science just as much as I love advocacy, but it's really just to be a public health champion, right? It's to get out there and share with the public, be a voice for um, uh, not only uh, raising awareness around these serious and inequitable uh, challenges, but also to be a, a source of uh, solutions and lifting up uh, what we know and what works. So, so on this last role, uh, being the voice for the public's health in, in California, uh, and, and as, as I think of the Surgeon Generals uh, who uh, have been effectively, who were effective in exercising that bully pulpit, right? You think of C. Everett Koop you know, with smoking, uh, you think of David Satcher okay, with health disparities. Now, Californians face a lot of great public health problems, some of the greatest existential uh, threats uh, in the 21st century. There are all sorts of problems that you could take on, from climate change, immunization, immigration. You took on something that not that many people have heard of outside of our circle, something called ACEs. Yes. What are ACEs and why is it that important? So adverse the term ACEs uh, is an acronym for Adverse Childhood Experiences, uh, which uh, comes after this, this, a study by the same name that was done by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, in which they asked 17 and a half thousand adults about their histories of 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences. And those include physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, or growing up in a household where a parent was mentally ill, substance dependent, incarcerated, where there was parental separation or divorce or domestic violence. And what they found were two things that were really groundbreaking. Number one is that ACEs are incredibly common. So uh, it, this doesn't just happen in certain zip codes to certain people over there. Two thirds of their population at Kaiser San Diego uh, which was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated, had experienced at least one ACE, and one in eight folks had experienced four or more. And what we see, you know, is in the two decades since that study has been published, um, that that prevalence is very similar uh, nationally and, in fact, globally, right? So very high prevalence. And the, and the second uh, piece 
which I think was kind of really groundbreaking, was unlike the common wisdom that I think many of us have, that if you have a rough childhood, yes, you're more likely to have issues with uh, mental health or uh, substance dependence, right? And they did find an incredibly strong dose-response relationship between early adversity and mental and behavioral outcomes, um, but also with some of the leading causes of death in the US, including heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, Alzheimer's, uh, et cetera. And so, uh, and there was this dose-response relationship where a person with four or more ACEs, we're talking about double the risk uh, for heart disease, double two and a half times the risk for stroke, uh, triple the risk of chronic lung disease, and uh, and so I, I th it, very similar in a similar fashion of the way past surgeons general have have looked at some of the most pressing health challenges and the leading causes of death, and asked that question: What is a modifiable root cause? Right. Similarly, so you know, when you look at smoking, you can, you can take on, uh, you can advance the care for lung cancer and for emphysema and for heart disease and all these downstream outcomes. Or when we launched a coordinated effort to reduce the prevalence of smoking, right, what we saw was improvements in all of those outcomes. Similarly, you know, I can, I can take on um, yeah, heart, all, all of these different factors, but we recognize that um, childhood adversity is a common root cause. And not only that, it also gives us really powerful insights into the mechanisms of some of the most urgent issue of our, issues of our day, specifically around when we understand that um, acute, Accumulate, accumulated adversity, cumulative adversity, actually has an impact on our stress response system, right? And that impacts our later risk of heart disease, right? It helps us understand that when a black boy is walking down the street and they gets profiled, right, and gets stopped, Hey, that same stress response is what's being activated. And the more times it, it's activated, the greater the risk to your health, right? And similarly, we're seeing that around the country as immigrant communities are facing ice raids. And uh, this, this impact of cumulative adversity has a really direct impact on long-term health. And understanding those mechanisms as a root cause mechanism, I think it's, it's foundational. So childhood trauma and heart disease, childhood trauma and mental and behavioral health problems. Now, I'm in a room full of uh, folks who are really well trained in epidemiology, and they are not going to let me get away you know, without asking this question about you know, that, that association uh, doesn't always imply causation. Right? Mm, yes. So, so as... <laughs> What's the biological plausible kind of mechanism of kind of linking to childhood trauma to all of these later outcomes? Oh, this is, so this is like my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> um, so, there, so there are two pieces. I'm going to answer the question in, in, uh, in, in two ways. So one is the, the, the biological mechanism, which is understanding that um, we all have our, what, you know, what we call our fight or flight response. When we experience something scary or threatening, it activates the amygdala, which is the alarm, and that activates our biological stress response, um, including you know, stress hormones that release adrenaline and cortisol uh, and so our, you know, our hearts start to pound, our, our pupils dilate, our airways open up, right? This is what the stress response was designed to do, and it saves our life from a mortal threat. But what the science shows us is that if that stress response is activated repeatedly, too often, without adequate buffering caregiving systems, it can become dysregulated. 
and it can become overactive. And one of the critical pieces is that um, uh, timing matters, right? So when I was here at Berkeley, I had the privilege of studying under Dr. Tyrone Hayes, who is here in the room, um, in the Hayes lab, studying uh, amphibian endocrinology, right? And what we found, what I learned in the Hayes lab is that when we expose tadpoles to corticosteroids, right, stress hormones, that the impact that those stress hormones had on those tadpoles was um, really depended on how close those tadpoles were to metamorphosis, right? So if they were more mature, right about to hit metamorphosis, those stress hormones were adaptive and, that, and it helped them uh, speed up metamorphosis and you know, jump out of that drying pond, whatever it's causing them the stress. But if they were too little, if it was too early in their development, right, it, uh, it led to a series of changes that ultimately dramatically diminished their survival and could eat. So, so the timing, that same exposure of stress hormones, right, the timing makes a difference. And that's the same thing that we see in humans as well, right? Because children's brains and bodies are just developing, high doses of adversity in childhood, and especially in the first 100 days to the first five years, have an outsized impact on children's developmental trajectory. And it's not just the structure and function of children's developing brains, but it's also their developing immune systems, their hormonal, hormonal systems, and even the way their DNA is read and transcribed, their epigenetic regulation. So that is some of the, the kind of the juicy science behind this. But when we talk about um, ACEs and heart disease, for example, I think it's really, really important for us to recognize uh, when we look at the, uh, the criteria for looking at um, causal inference, right? Um, there's the dose-response relationship. Mm -hmm. You have to uh, understand that, um, which we see with ACEs. We have a plausible biolo biological mechanism, which we also see. Um, there's also, you know, when we see in natural experiment, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, we also see these in, uh, in other species, right? So we're making these cross species. So the rigor of the data, I hear people say sometimes, well, the ACE data, and was that the right, you know, was that the right study, and was it structured the right way, and was it controlled the right way? And it's like, this is just one piece of information that we are using, assembling, with a much broader body of science that goes everywhere from our broad scale epidemiologic surveillance data, right, which we have from uh, over 20 countries around the world, right, to the, the, the most basic molecular mechanisms about how our DNA is methylated when we're exposed to high doses of adversity, right? So it's, it's the full spectrum. So that was obviously a setup, right? Because yeah, when 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 uh, when, we're, when we were uh, at the National Academies, she just cannot stop talking about biology. So, so I'm gonna start to ask you some some harder questions. So, so, so what can the state of California do uh, about childhood trauma and toxic stress? Um, so there is not only a lot that we can do. But I'm, I'm really excited to talk about what we are doing. Okay, start with that. Um, and, and to start, so one of the, the biggest projects that I'm taking on coming into the role of State Surgeon General is leading California's efforts to implement routine screening for adverse childhood experiences among our Medicaid population. So if there's one thing that the evidence shows us, right, is that early detection and early intervention improves outcomes. And so as we move towards a statewide effort for routine screening to enable early detection and early intervention, that is my amazing job. And uh, what, 
what we're doing there is uh, currently we're in process of, de uh, of I want to say developing, we're actually adapting an existing training, but um, developing a training for our 88,000 primary care providers to, uh, to, number one, understand best practices for screening for adverse childhood experiences, and number two, understand the fundamentals of trauma-informed care, right? And for once, this is not an unfunded mandate. <laughs> so, um, Governor Newsom, uh, in, in this year's budget, put $40.8 million to uh, reimburse providers for screening for ACEs. If you're a Medicaid provider in the state of California, starting in January of 2020, when you do an ACE screening, you will get a reimbursement for every single patient, man, woman, and child, that you screen. And also included in the budget was $50 million, and we're hoping to draw down some additional dollars in a federal match to train providers on how to do the screening and how to respond with trauma-informed care. That level of investment at a statewide level is unprecedented. However, as you and I work together on the National Academies Committee, one of the things that I, I feel maybe most excited and happy about uh, as a, one of the products uh, in the, the Vibrant and Healthy Kids report is this framework of understanding that fundamentally at the core, we have our exposures and experiences and how they impact our biology. Right? So how the activation of the stress response leads to changes in brain development and immune system and all of those things. But then that next level is this framework of understanding how the family system impacts the, um, the likelihood right, that someone will be exposed to adverse experiences. And then enveloping that family system is uh, our community, uh, the, the ecological systems, our neighborhoods, our healthcare systems, our structural systems. And then on top of that are really some of the structural frameworks in terms of uh, our policies and, uh, and, and our uh, social infrastructure, right? And all of those things impact the odds of exposure, and the odds of developing morbidity and mortality, right? Disease and death, once you've been exposed. And one of the things that I'm really proud of, this is like my favorite thing about this job. Can you tell this is my dream job? <laughs> is that I get to not only work at that level of uh, you know, working with clinicians to advance our clinical practices and, and uh, implementing routine screening, but I also get to sit across the table from the superintendent of edu public education, right? And have a conversation about how our educational systems should be delivering doses of buffering, right? And how we need trauma-informed uh, practices and policies in our educational systems. I literally was stopped on the street by the gentleman who is the head of our uh, state, I think it's police officers, um, it was an organization, um, and he was like, oh my gosh, P police officers, like, we want to be in this, we want to be doing trauma-informed policing. And I'm just like, oh my God, give me your card, right? Um, this is a, some of the, I, I get to work with my colleagues um, in, in the governor's office and across state leadership on how we're supporting low-income families, on how we're moving towards uh, enhancing um, paid family leave, right? So that parents and kids can establish that bonding connection that has lifelong impacts. This is, this is all of the work that we are doing right now uh, in the current administration. Wow. So did you always know that you wanted to become Surgeon General when you were growing up? <laughs> to, 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 tell, tell us about okay, your, your life story and, and like how, 
How did you get to this position? I think that's just what every girl dreams of, isn't it? <laughs> Am I wrong? <laughs> Um, so I, I um, so, so true story, I knew that I wanted to be a pediatrician from the time I was four years old. And when I was five, I wrote a letter to my doctor and I was trying to figure out how God got the skin on because there were no buttons and there were no, like, there were no zippers. <laughs> Ultimately, I figured it out. He did not write back, but I figured it out, which was the drawstring theory. That's what your belly button is for. <laughs> um, um, but I always, always, always wanted to be a physician. And I, it could be related to the fact that my dad is a biochemist and my mom is a nurse, so I kind of grew up in this scientific household. But none of my brothers are in the sciences, so who knows? Um, um, and... The funny thing about it is I, I always wanted to be a physician. I always wanted to uh, serve underserved communities and, um, and, and do community health. That was, I think that was just part of um, my background. I'm a proud immigrant. My family came to the United States from Jamaica. And I always grew up with a really powerful sense of community. Oh, some Yardies in the house! <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I always grew up with this really, really strong sense of community. Uh, and so that was always really powerful. And so even, um, even uh, when I was in medical school and I learned about this concept of like, oh, I can go to public health school, right? Like that was uh, a, a beautiful, exciting moment for me. Um, you know, I will tell you that when the Newsom administration called me and they said, um, uh, we would like for you to consider uh, being the Surgeon General of California, I, I was like, oh, there's no such thing as the Surgeon General of California. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah, it was really funny. When I, when I actually sat down with the governor, he's like, I know, I'm making it. And I was just like, oh! <laughs> um, uh, but this is uh, obviously my dream job. I, I feel like this is something that I was born to do um, in terms of all of my experiences, my experiences of growing up black in America, um, my experiences of being an immigrant, um, my experiences of uh, dedicating my career to serving underserved communities. Um, but then also, you know, my profound love of science. Like I'm just such a science geek. Like that's my, and to, and, and I think the other thing um, that I love is that I just love people. Like I love connecting with people. I love hearing people's stories and I believe, and I feel like this is something that, I, uh, that I've believed for a long time, but I learned even more deeply and profoundly in public health school, that we are powerful. We are powerful. Our voices are powerful. The way that we take that science and, and, and filter it through this prism of our lived experience to generate scientific insights that can change outcomes for so many people, that is powerful. Uh, and so, yeah, for me, <laughs> when I got the call uh, and I, uh, I don't know if I should admit this publicly, but when I got <laughs> off the phone, like when I hung up the phone, the, the first word out of my mouth was an expletive. <laughs> uh, because I knew that my life was about to change in a really, really powerful and exciting way. Well, I'm actually really glad that you brought up black immigrant woman because all day I, I've been thinking about, well, how, how do I bring this topic up 
Uh, you know, uh, th these are some of the hardest conversations that, that you know, our society is unable to have today, but I always believe that, that uh, universities, especially schools of public health, you know, ought to be better. So when, when you uh, were appointed, uh, the headline for one of the news story was, a black immigrant woman is now the most powerful health official in California. <laughs> How do you think your background has helped you get here? And how do you think your background has hindered you, your way, your path here? Um, many of the things that immediately come to mind when you ask that question are the, the same answer for both questions. So um, when I started at um, uh, UC Davis School of Medicine in 1997, uh, it was immediately after the Bakke decision. Um, it was after Prop 209 uh, here in California. And for, for those of you, uh, Prop 209, uh, essentially uh, re eliminated the use of essential affirmative action in, um, uh, in policies and decisions. Um, and uh, so it was, an, it was an interesting experience going to UC Davis at that time. And I had uh, one, a friend of mine who had, you know, we had done our, uh, undergrad together here at Cal, go Bears. And, um, and so it, we had this um, a very interesting experience. On four different occasions in my first year of medical school, someone told me, uh, I know you're only here because of affirmative action. And I'm like, there isn't even any affirmative action anymore. How could you say that? Um, but but something to the something to the effect that you don't belong here. And uh, <laughs> it's I mean it, it, one of the interesting things is that age old saying, right? It's that age old saying that uh, you know you have to be twice as good to get half as far. For for me. Um, it really strengthened my resolve uh, to be excellence. And I think that my resolve to be excellent was strengthened uh, by a number of different experiences. I think on the one hand, by those who doubted me and sometimes expressed it to my face. And on the other hand, uh, my resolve for excellence was strengthened by my um, commitment to serving underserved communities because I had the experience of seeing, uh, for example, when I was in medical school and I was the co-director of a student-run uh, clinic for uh, uninsured um, uh, communities in Sacramento, um, that they, there were so many fewer providers to care for people who don't have a lot, a lot of money, low-income people of color primarily. And, um, and I felt like, oh, these people need the best doctor. They need, because that's their only resource. And if you don't know what you're doing, um, they won't know. And so it is... Uh, such an imperative for me to to hit the books, to to know my um, uh, you, you, just to know my science, my medicine, my clinical practice inside and out. Uh, and then I feel like one of the most amazing things as a scientist is that. Breakthroughs in science come when you combine um, the, the scientific knowledge with 
a different way of looking uh, or seeing things. And I felt that my experience, both my personal experience as, as, um, as, as a black woman and an immigrant, but also uh, the proximity that I was able to experience with my patients um, gave me so many insights. Stuff that I didn't learn in medical school. Stuff that I never would have like, oh, you know, how is it that we would, uh, you, like uh, it was something that I, I wrote about in my book. One of my patients said to me, you know, I was, I was caring for a patient who had asthma and uh, we were trying to figure out her asthma trigger. So I'm like, could it be pet dander? All the stuff that I had learned in my medical training, right? My excellent training at Stanford, right? Could it be pet dander? Could it be cockroaches? Could it be pollen? Could it be cleaning products? Could it be, you know, what is it could be triggering this little girl's asthma? And her mom said to me, oh, you know, doctora, I noticed that my daughter's asthma tends to act up every time her dad punches a hole in the wall. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's where my brain takes the combination of all the science that I learned in medical school and all the public health, you know, but it, it filtered it through this prism of experience that I never would have had if I did not, um, uh, if, if I wasn't in that circumstances and, ha and having that conversation with that mom. We, uh, we're going to start collecting your questions, uh, but uh, while we're doing that, uh, we got a lot of students in this room, uh, and uh, you know, many of them aspire to be you uh, someday. What, what knowledge, skills, tools, experiences that, uh, that knowing what you know today uh, you wish you had, um, uh, that, that you had spent more time learning when you were getting your MPH at Berkeley of the East? Um, well, the first thing I will say to all the, the public health students out there is go ahead and pay attention in biostats and epi, y'all, <laughs> because you will use that. <laughs> um, no, those are the tools that I still use on a regular basis today. So. Um, um, but, you know, frankly, I think that uh, the greatest tool that I learned as part of my public health training um, was really a frame of reference, how to, how, to see, um, how to see and interpret what was going on around me. And um, I think that um, most of the folks in this room will, will recall or recognize like day one of public health school, what you see is that population curve, right? And you slice and dice that population curve in a, you know, for whatever disease or condition in lots of different ways. And you can look at the, uh, you know, the tail end of the curve for the folks who are most severely affected and look at you know, what do strategies that target that part of the curve, what are they able to accomplish, or what happens when you shift the curve, right? And I think that in, in medical school, my training really was, okay, someone's in front of me, they have a condition, how do I treat this person in front of me? And it was really my public health training when I was seeing child after child after child who was experiencing high doses of adversity, and whether it was asthma or you know, attention deficit or some autoimmune disorder, to move out of that framework that I was trained in in medical school of, of what's the treatment for this patient to the framework that I was trained in in public health school of what's the treatment for this community, right? Um, and that was really, really powerful. Um, so I will say that m more my experience is being grateful every day for my public health training, because it really was um, a, a wonderful experience. All right, let, let me call up uh, our student who's going to be reading the questions, and I hope I don't butcher your name. Omonivier Agod 
Abogany. Abogany. Good evening. Om Nithya Abogany. I'll be reading Thank you. Uh, my, I'm going to have a tough time at graduation. I, I just know. Uh, but uh, you are uh, a student in our, well, a one year MPH student in our interdisciplinary uh, program, and you're between second and third year of medical school where? Yes, so I attend medical school at Wright State University Boonshaw School of Medicine in Dayton, Ohio. And I also went here for undergrad. Go Bears. <laughs> <laughs> Go Bears. All right, and do we have, oh, we got questions. Okay, so the first question for you, Dr. Burke Harris, is what has been the most challenging and rewarding thing in developing your role as the first Surgeon General in California? What has surprised you? I'll, ask, I'll answer the second question first. So what has surprised me the most is the talent, brilliance, and dedication of my colleagues in state service. I am going to say, whatever that term is good enough for government work, <laughs> where did that come from? I honestly, I think that there's, um, I, I will have to say that I came into this role uh, and I, um, have potentially with some, I just, I had no idea to expect such uh, amazing talent and dedication from my, from my government service colleagues. I mean, really it, uh, un, unparalleled. Um, that has been my biggest surprise and it's been a really wonderful surprise. Um, what it has been the biggest challenge? So I, uh, Government bureaucracy is a very interesting experience. <laughs> this is my first time in government, and I, uh, I, I was sworn in in February, and, um, and understanding how the, um, the process works, right? That whole machinery of government, uh, the, the budgeting process, the legislative process, and, um, and the fact that it, for real, if it's really not in the budget, it really can't happen. <laughs> I'm like, really? Can I get a stapler? <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, that's, that, I think, has been I th the biggest, um, I think, again, challenge on the one hand, but, you know, amazing learning about how things actually work. I think from, for most of us in this room, as we're thinking about public health, we're thinking about uh, developing, implementing, or influencing policies that impact very large numbers of people. And there's, uh, there's no more powerful tool to do that than in government. And so understanding how government works um, and really the nuts and bolts of it has been uh, a great education and sometimes makes me want to pull my hair out. <laughs> okay, next question. As a pediatrician in a low resource FQAC setting, I am concerned about the possibility of universal ACEs screening. Mm. I piloted the PEARLS tool in my clinic, but we lack the resources to help our patients we screen. What does the state plan to do to provide services and support for patients and healthcare systems when we have identified those at risk? That is a wonderful question. Thank you so much. So um, one of the, uh, so there are a couple of pieces that I want to pull apart there. Um, so one important piece is that uh, a, a recognition that uh, when it comes to ACE screening, I think that there is a belief for many folks that in order to be able to screen for ACEs, um, you have to have either a robust mental health um, uh, uh, resources or social work resources in order to be able to respond. And I think that one of the most important uh, things that we can do is help primary care providers recognize what they can do in the primary care home um, that can improve patient outcomes uh, even in absence of those resources, right? That's one of the, because I, I actually think there's an incredible power uh, in that. And helping folks to understand, uh, for example, about 
um, how we can counsel patients about um, sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health, and healthy relationships, helping uh, patients understand um, about how early adversity affects um, their, their health and uh, being able to um, support them in, in the hygiene that can help to improve their outcomes, I think is, is really critically important. And, and just as an example, one example of that, right? Um, uh, one of the places that this plays out clinically is in the management of ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, right? We, uh, one of the things that we found uh, in our clinic is that when you look at the biology of adversity, uh, and you, on the functioning of the uh, prefrontal cortex, right? Is that if you have a little bit of stress hormones, right? If you don't have enough stress hormones, the prefrontal cortex, the part that's responsible for executive functioning, doesn't work very well. And so you're distracted, disorganized, impulsive, and forgetful. And so you add stress hormones and you improve prefrontal cortical functioning uh, up to a certain optimal point. And then if you continue to add uh, stress hormones, executive functioning declines, right? So it's this inverted U shape. And what's the most common treatment in America for attention deficit? Stimulants, right? And that makes sense if you're on this part of the curve where you need more, more uh, uh, stimulants to, to help you get good functioning. But if you have a child whose brain is bathed in stress hormones, right, then adding a stimulant may not help, and in some cases may even do harm. And, and I think that most of us have experienced that in the, in the sense of, oh, you know, this, this patient came in, they were on Ritalin, the Ritalin didn't work, right? So we added something else, that didn't seem to work, so now they're on an antipsychotic, right? I, I can't say how many patients that I've seen in that situation. And understanding the, that's a place where an ACE screen, when I am going into, a, you know, in my clinical practice, an ACE screen when a child is coming in with symptoms of ADHD, if their ACE score is a zero, right, compared to someone with an ACE screen of an eight, I actually um, start with different medications. Right? So a patient with an A screen of zero and all of the other meeting the criteria for ADHD, I might start with a stimulant. But if they have an A score of eight, I'm more likely to start with a medication that regulates the stress response, right? What's, what's called an, you know, an alpha adrenergic agonist like, um, like guanfacine, right? And that is my clinical practice, how I'm using this to treat my patients differently that um, has nothing to do with connecting them to an external resource. At the same time, we have to deal with the real challenge and discomfort. And I'm going to say for whoever wrote this question, right, that I'm going to, um, I'm, it, this requires us to sit in a space of discomfort between the time of identifying ACEs and fully deploying a public health response to be able to fully uh, support all families, right? So there are, so one of the things that I, A, when I, when I, uh, when we, in my former life, when we created the National Pediatric Practice Community on ACE screening, and we piloted a screening in a number of uh, centers around the country, one of the things that we learned is that screening for ACEs isn't just screening for ACEs. Step one, before you even implement a practice of screening, step one is to understand what you're going to do with a positive screen, right? And so whether that is, and you don't have to have it all in your clinic, but whether that is making a, com a, a connection to a community uh, community providers around um, mental health or social work, or um, if it's there are community-based organizations that can provide those supports. In some cases, it's making the connections to the schools, the educational um, institutions that might be able to provide some resources. But figuring out what you're going to do with a positive A score 
I think is almost more important than the score itself because it allows you to have a systematic way of responding to any patients who are in need. But the fact is, one of the biggest challenges is that we don't ask because we don't know what to do with a response. And what that means is that our patients are sitting with this. And they don't even have us as a resource to even validate their experience. And I will say the interesting thing about uh, Vince Felitti uh, and the work that he did as the principal investigator of the ACE study at Kaiser is that he implemented adding the ACE screen into the intake at Kaiser. Um, uh, he did it, they got funding to do it as a pilot and they did it for 110,000 patients. And they didn't hire a single additional uh, social worker or mental health professional, right? And what they found is that in the following year, their ER visits dropped by, and I, I believe it was 25%, and their uh, uh, sick visits uh, dropped by 11%. And it wasn't a very well-controlled study, right? However, what Dr. Felitti reports from that was that just to have, it was, it was powerful for patients to be able to acknowledge the, that there is a connection between what has happened to them and what's happening in their health, right? So that acknowledgement, uh, I think, is, as they say, both diagnostic and therapeutic, right? But in addition, that doesn't alleviate our obligation to have... Um, uh, systems that support and heal. And that is the work that we are uh, doing in earnest now around how do we use our current resources? How do we look at deploying our Medicaid dollars? How are we addressing uh, the mental health crisis in our state? And, and uh, so uh, what I want to say to that is that work is absolutely happening. Um, at the same time. You answered so many questions within that. <laughs> um, next question, what kinds of interventions would you suggest for adults who have already experienced ACEs? Uh, my short answer is sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health, and healthy relationships. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, um, and that's just, I mean, those are some of the evidence-based um, uh, evidence-based interventions, looking at the physiology of toxic stress. So when you have an overactive stress response, right, the changes, uh, the impact that it has on, uh, on the brain, um, the immune system, the hormonal systems, and uh, the way our DNA is read and transcribed. So all of those interventions uh, reduce stress hormones, reduce inflammation, and, um, and um, uh, regulate against some of the, the cellular and oxidative um, injury that we see with toxic stress. Does A screening include gun ownership and gun violence? And what is the state of California doing about gun violence as a public health crisis? Um, a screening does not include gun ownership and gun violence. The, the traditional ACEs criteria. So when we use the term ACEs, right, uh, when we're rigorous to the science, we're applying those to the criteria that were um, uh, included in the ACE study by Felidi and Anda. Was it by any means exhaustive? Did they pick the magical 10 things that uh, increase your risk for uh, negative health outcomes? Um, they didn't, although they did have a little bit of magic in the 10 criteria that they picked uh, in the sense that um, each of these, each of the 10 criteria do uh, somewhat of a double whammy of being a significant stressor for the child and also taking out the other piece, which is the other criteria for toxic stress, which is adequate buffering caregiving, right? So if your parent is incarcerated, not only are you stressed out, but you're missing your parent, but that parent isn't there to, to be a buffer. Similarly, if there's domestic violence happening or intimate partner violence, right? Not only is the violence stressful, but there's uh, 
but the ability of your caregivers to be a buffer to your stress is diminished. And so I, I feel like that's a little bit of the, the secret sauce um, uh, in, in the ACEs criteria. Um, and the reason that's important is because when we say an individual with four more ACEs has doubled the risk for heart disease, right? That gives us a public health imperative. And so looking at having rigorous relative risk data is, that, is actually really important. And when you change those criteria, right, then you, you, you would get a different set of odds ratios, right? So you can't compare apples to oranges. Um, in terms of gun violence, what we do know, right, is that the mechanism by which ACEs lead to negative health outcomes is this mechanism of toxic stress, right? Overactivity of the stress response and absence of the buffering. And what we know is that when kids are, uh, when any one of us uh, is impacted by gun violence, that that activates the stress response and that that can also impair the ability of our buffering um, uh, caregiving systems when the entire community is impacted by a terrible uh, incidence of gun violence. And um, California has been uh, a leader in addressing gun violence. So just uh, this year, I stood with the governor as he signed uh, legislation uh, it, implementing background checks for ammunition. Uh, California has implemented red flag laws. Uh, California uh, ha has really led the way, it really kind of pushing the envelope uh, and, and getting pushed back with, with litigation, right? On, um, on really trying to implement uh, as much common sense gun safety for public health and public well-being uh, that we can. Uh, one of the big challenges is that individual states can pass this legislation, but what we see is that when individuals can obtain uh, firearms with large capacity magazines from a neighboring state, right, we're only as safe as the gun laws in our closest neighboring state. Time for a couple more questions. Okay. What is the one thing K through 12 public education should do for ACEs prevention and mitigation? Great question. So uh, if there was one thing, I would say um, uh, training and education for every single individual in the educational environment around trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive practices, uh, because I believe that um, uh, when we know better, we do better. And for many educators, they, there's, when educators don't understand that a child potentially acting out in class may actually be exhibiting symptoms of toxic stress, and that when we come down on them with harsh disciplinary practices rather than recognizing that we have the opportunity to, to be delivering doses of buffering care in those moments, right? Um, uh, that's a huge missed opportunity. I feel like our educational systems have an enormous opportunity to be delivering doses of buffering every day. Um, but that also requires our educators to um, understand and be practicing self-care, right? And understanding how they, if I'm an educator, my own history of adversity may be impacting how I'm showing up in the classroom. And the thing about this is, is that none of this is inevitable, right? Uh, we can and we are right now implementing policies and, and practices that are improving outcomes for patients, for students, for individuals across sectors, right? Um, it's really about having the skills and tools that we can implement systematically to make a big difference. And for our last question, do you think you can use your position on child stress and trauma to address this administration and Trump regarding separation of children from their parents um, and being on the border and caging them? 
Um, <laughs> so um, this is actually uh, one of the things about this role that I feel uh, most gratified about um, because while there are really, really challenging, tragic, uh, and, and fundamentally difficult things that are happening right now, I'm really glad that I'm in this fight. So I, uh, I think I'm looking at my communication. Can I say? Can I say? Uh, next week? Yeah. Oh yeah, okay, so, oh, I'm just checking. <laughs> I'm trying not to get myself in trouble. I've never been in public uh, uh, office before, so then I say something, I'm like, I gotta watch out. So um, this is, uh, so next week, next, uh, next Thursday actually, I will be um, um, uh, testifying before the Department of Homeland Security on this very issue. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. And I'll leave these with you because if oh, there's one thing you. I learned in med school, just because we didn't talk about it in class doesn't mean it's not on the test. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let me do three things before we close. I, I kind of gave uh, Nadine a heads up that that as soon as we close, you're going to get mobbed by, by these requests for selfies and, and everything. So, so I got to do these three things uh, first. Uh, uh, first of all, just really want to thank you for, for, for doing this. Uh, <laughs> the, the, this started, uh, I, I think we were at a committee meeting, and I had just found out that I was going to become dean of uh, the, the School of Public Health, and I asked Nadine, hey, do you want to come and speak at the School of Public Health? Uh, and she said yes, and then I just recently found out that usually people pay her like $15,000. <laughs> <laughs> and not only is she doing this free, for the Berkeley public health community. She even came in early today to spend some time with our students. So I don't have $15,000 to pay you, <laughs> but we do have some uh, presents for you. I'm gonna bring up uh, our, our, our assistant dean uh, for strategy and external relations, uh, Priya Mehta. A little public oh, health. Oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> thank you so much. So, so there is a Berkeley public health T-shirt that I hope you will wear proudly. Uh, that the the and by the way, the 15 G's was before I was Surgeon General. <laughs> I'm in public service now, so <laughs> <laughs> these are last season yeah, shoes. Are, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The second thing, I, I want to make sure I invite all of you to come back on November 12th. It's the 35th anniversary of the Berkeley Wellness Letter. Uh, so we're going to do a big celebration around that. Uh, and then lastly, I just want to do a little bit of uh, traffic copying. Because uh, like I said, you know, like it's going to get crazy pretty soon. I think there are going to be so many people that want to take selfies with you and everything. So we're going to position ourselves like uh, kind of down below where it says Berkeley Public Health, uh, Berkeley, uh, and uh, you know, she's been so kind and generous to agree to you know, kind of shake hands with you, talk with you, uh, take pictures, uh, but, but uh, certainly we have a great reception out there for all of you, and hopefully you know, we'll try to get as many uh, uh, selfies uh, <laughs> Can as I say possible. one thing before yeah, we yeah, close? Yeah. So yeah, you know, the way, I I will say that um, uh, first of all, when Michael Lou invites you to come and speak, you don't say no, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, what I will say is that um, I believe fundamentally that social determinants of health are to the 21st century what infectious disease was to the 20th century. And in my role as California's first Surgeon General, it is my intention 
to lay the infrastructure to ensure that we in California will cut ACEs in half in one generation. And y'all are gonna help me do it. <laughs> I'll see you at the reception. Right, please thank join you. me in thanking the team.